Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Mosaic Podcast. You know, I don't know how it happens in the world that the right people come to me at the right time. The chances of me meeting these people on a, on, in my day-to-day -day life was probably pretty small. We probably live in circles that don't intersect all that much. But I have a silent prayer that I put out as I started to look at the situation that was happening in the world. And these people came to me before that even happened. And I just had a conversation with them. And I said, yeah, I don't know. It's not really what my show does, but I just want to have them on. And I'm so happy that I did that because now what's happened from that initial conversation that I had with Tamika, maybe a few weeks ago, three weeks ago, something like that, four weeks ago, yeah. suddenly the story is now front and center into the national news. Because what happened to one man who had no desire to have his voice even be heard, had his voice and his breath strangled out of him and a public lynching for everybody in the world to see. In a, in, a, in a display of abuse, victimization, and corruption by a police officer who put his knee on the throat of George Floyd and kept his knee on his throat two minutes and 43 seconds after he had already passed out and died. What world are we living in? Now, their story that I'm about to talk to you about is not that story, but it could equally have been that story. Today, I want to introduce you to um, people that I just somehow, I don't know why, I just love them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I love the courage of how they're living their life, not only for the stories that they're having the courage to tell, but for the way they don't let anything get in their way. I want to introduce you to Tamiko and Stormy Archie. They are the creators, writers, directors, producers, and film crew for a new <laughs> film series that launched on On Channel and became the, one of the most viewed film series the channel has ever had. The series is called Behind Closed Doors. Here's the amazing thing. Neither one of them had ever shot a film before. Neither one of them had any idea how to make a film or what to do. They learned it in the University of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Where they just watched these YouTube videos and they DIY'd it. DIY. <laughs> DIY'd it, right? <laughs> and and they did it themselves. And what courage it takes not only to do that process, but when you hear the stories that are that they're telling, they had the courage to tell their story through the characters that they introduce in their series. Behind Closed Doors weaves the dramatic stories of four characters struggling with real-life issues of domestic and sexual abuse, mental illness, and drug addiction. The stories they tell, for the most part, are from what they witnessed and experienced as children. It's a story of those who suffer in silence and how that suffering remains long after the trauma is done. The first season of Behind Closed Doors, produced by people who YouTube their, their whole experience of how to create it, had over 14,000 views within the first two weeks. And it is OWN Network's most popular stream series. When I look at the world today, these are the heroes that I see. People that have the courage to stand up when no one else is standing up. People have the courage to tell the story of abuse, of drug, of drug addiction, of sexual trauma, of mental illness, to a world 
that has tried to keep it all behind closed doors. When I look at our government and our inability to stand up to a president who is, who is doing things that are not presidential, who is using his power of abuse and, and his party cannot stand up to him, I see a life that is living behind closed doors. When I see the white supremacists of the world today trying to push and choke out the air of the black nation, black and brown people, our brothers and sisters who just because their skin is a different color, people seem to think they can be treated like animals or things. I see a world that's living behind closed doors. When I see the housing market change because one black family moved into a neighborhood and the same houses that had a certain value one minute ago now have lost their value or dropped their value, I see something that is a life that is living behind closed doors. When I see a people applying for a job and not being given a job because of the color of their skin, I see a world that is living behind closed doors. Who knows where their series will go in season two, which is about to start. But I would love to invite them to look at not only their situation in a micro vision, but in the macro vision of how our world is living behind closed doors. It is my honor, my real honor, to call to attention some of the heroes that exist in this world that go unrecognized. And to Miko and Stormy Archie, I welcome you with all my heart to the Mosaic Podcast. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Thank you for, for having, having us. us. It is a pleasure. Um, let's get into it, because otherwise it's just me, a white guy talking about, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and who cares? The fact that this is based on your life story, to the extent that you're comfortable using this platform as another platform for you to tell your stories, each of you together or individually, however you want to do it. I'd like you to spend a few minutes and talk to me about your parents, about the environment you came into, and how in the world does something like this happen to two beautiful young ladies? <laughs> well, uh, I'm Tamika Archie. Um, so I, for me, a lot of the stories, as you stated, were actually based, the first season was based off of my childhood um, history. I was molested by my father. Um, my mother um, suffered uh, from a mental illness and, uh, and suffered from bipolar. Mm. Um, and my, my father was also an alcoholic. In the process of everything, and my mom feeling as though she did not protect me, she turned to drugs. Mm -hmm. So um, I was raised by my grandparents. Um, the state did take me away, and I was raised by my grandparents. But I did go um, to visit my mom during the summers to try to build some type of relationship with her. So for me, it was um, growing up, I, I grew up as a very angry child because I could not understand how this could happen to me. Um, I was a daddy's girl. So I, so, you know, like any other girl, you know, they're a daddy's girl. So, but, so I couldn't understand why he would violate me in that manner. I, I, I'm just going to jump in for a minute. I have a 30 year old, I have the honor of having a 30 year old developmentally delayed daughter. And she is a daddy's girl and I can't imagine I wash her. I have to bathe her. I have to change her clothes. I have to change. She, she still poops in her pants. But during the course of time that I had her over that period of time, my wife passed away of a terrible cancer when she was between the ages of four and eight, she was sick and at eight, she passed away. So I was, I, a, a man's man who said, I'm never going to change a diaper was suddenly in a world where I'm still changing diapers 30 years later, right? But I, had, I would have a nanny come and stay with me and one of the nannies got mad at something that I did and they called child services and they said he's abusing his daughter. 
and they came knocking at my door and my whole soul dropped out of my body. And I said, what do you say to somebody who tells you you're abusing your daughter? The only thing I can say to you is the nanny's not here anymore. I have a, I have a bedroom. I would like to invite you to stay with us as long as you, as long as you want. Because, and I want you to just watch what's going on. Because if I am abusing my daughter, then lock me up. Because that's the furthest thing that I ever would ever want to do. I just don't believe that's the reality. They looked at me and they said, sir, we can tell from looking at you right, right now. There's no chance that you were doing that. And, and I wasn't. But that doesn't mean other people were. I can't even imagine how a dad treats his daughter and a daughter who looks to her dad for, to, to protect her deals with that situation. You think it's any wonder you got angry? I mean, how could you not have? Correct. Correct. Right. And, and so when you got angry, uh, Stormy, are you, is, is this a part of your story also, or are you quiet on this? No, second season is a part of mine. Okay. So, All right. but yeah, the first season, you know, I just knew, you know, I knew her story, right? And I know other people that have that same, that similar story. Um, and so I wanted to get it out there and to tell the story was her vision. But for my vision is for people like me who haven't been through things like that is, you know, try to get an understanding and, you know, try to find out why people act the way they do, you know, because sometimes, you know, you might have a person that will lash out at you. You don't even know why. Right. And, you know, instead of jumping on them and saying or cutting them off and like, you know, I don't want to talk to you no more or, you know, getting outraged and trying to jump on the world. Stop and think, okay, it's not me. What is it? Why are you upset? What What's happening? You know, I try to get to the root cause of things. And so in having this series, I felt like it would, it should help people better understand that, you know, everything, is, everything isn't about you. Yeah. yeah. You know, at the end of the day, it's not, you know, and so you get an understanding of, okay, let me stop and try to figure out what's actually happening here. Yeah. You know? And also, hope you know, hopefully somebody see themselves in these people. Yeah. And they'd be willing to go ahead and tell their story or, you know, they may see it happening to somebody and, you know, go ahead and say, hey, let me try to stop this. Let me see what I can do to help. You know, because even, you know, as you brought up with George Floyd, just think about it. You know, could his life been saved if the person with the camera video had to push the officer off? Had yeah. the, had they came, had, you know, had the courage to say, stop. Yeah. Move. Yeah. And and we think the person with the camera video is a hero because they caught it on camera. So it was no longer he said, he said. But they, we don't even think that, hold it, the real hero would have pushed the, <laughs> the mofo off of him, right? You would have got the crowd and get, get off of this guy. He can't breathe, right? And there were three other people standing there, police officers could have done the same. And yet, look what's happened as a result of one man, right? And so... What I want to just do is encourage you to keep telling your stories like this, because who knows what will happen as a result of these stories. Right. Tamika, were you threatened to stay silent? Um, yes. So um, in my situation, um, it, it transpired for a while. Um, in the beginning, and it's a, a uh, while is one year, three months, 10 years. No. So it started from kindergarten to the uh, sixth grade. Wow. That's a so I, I started, um, I remember, um, just like it was yesterday, I was in the, um, third grade and I, um, seen a movie. It was a, um, movie with Ted dancing in it. It was called something about Amelia. And I watched that movie and the young girl, he was, um, he was molesting his daughter and the young girl, um, she told a teacher. So I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. Wow. So I told a teacher and the teacher called my mom and called my grandmother. Well, my mom couldn't believe it. And so she took, she told my dad. And when I got home, my dad beat her. Um, so I was brought up in domestic violence as well. My dad beat her for calling him out of work. And then he beat me for saying anything. So they took me, so my mom just kept asking me every day because 
my dad was beating her. And that's kind of how it really started is because my mom started working at night because she was tired of being beaten by him. So she started working at night to stay away. That way she wouldn't get beaten. And then he turned, that's when he turned um, to me and started molesting me. So um, she finally kept asking and asking. And finally I told her, because I got tired of asking and I felt like they didn't believe me anyway. I told her I made it up. So they put me in therapy. Yeah, so they put me in therapy. Well, it continued to happen and continued to happen. And so um, then I would have like little rashes and things like that and they couldn't understand why. Then then of course I um, developed really, really fast. So finally um, in the sixth grade, my mom, she said that she had a dream that she came into the house from work early and he was laying on top of me in the living room. And, um, and so she wanted me to tell her if was he messing with me and she promised to protect me. And I tried to deny cause I was like, no, you know, in my mind, you didn't protect me the first time, right, right. you know, but she promised that he would not come home and that she would take me to my grandparents house and that I would be protected. And so then at that point, that's when I told her, but as I've gotten older and we talked about it again, I just told her that it was really weird that she had that particular dream because the night before that is exactly where he had me. And so for her, for, for that to be revealed to her in a dream, it was just really weird. So she, she was really hard on herself yeah, about it. Nothing. Yes. And so, you know, she, she um, turned to drugs. She tried to commit suicide. But, you know, as years got, years got on and we were able to talk about it, because for me, I went through therapy, went through a self-validation, went through a self-therapeutic uh, moment for me to be, move on through my life. My mom never did. Yeah. My mom, my mom passed away last year uh, in September and she took that pain still with her to the grave. Wow. So, um, but we had the conversation and I told her, I said, if you really think about it, you met him when you were 16. Yeah. He was 24. Wow. So you were molested as well. Wow. But back then, you just think that, you know, people saw it as you just being a fast tail girl is what they would say it and promiscuous wife. And so that was kind of normal. I said, but in all actuality, he showed you then that he liked young girls. Wow. Wow. Did your abuse stop with your dad or did it continue in other places? Um, well, the sexual abuse stopped with my father, but as um, time progressed on in my relationships, um, I found myself um, being in relationships where I would be um, abused. And for me, even though I tried so hard of not wanting to be that person, I found myself in those situations and would make excuses. Yeah. Well, well sometimes I think, like for me, my parents both passed away when I was a kid, two years apart on the same day. And so f- when I think about what love is, because I, I didn't grow up in, abusive really, in, in an abusive family. I grew up in sort of a lower middle class white family where we didn't have any money, but we, were, we laughed a lot and had fun. I believe love is people aren't, there, people aren't there very long. And so the way I crafted a lot of the relationships I was in is I would laugh, I would have fun, we would have a great time. And then at a certain point, I would just go away because that's what happened. We don't, love means you don't stay around that long. And so is it possible even in your thought process at all that you created a story in your mind that love meant abuse, physical, sexual, whatever? No, I, I did not. Um, cause I, I always stated what I would not do. Right. But I think I was longing for something. I was always the type of person where I would always see the good in people. So my grandparents ended up raising me and my grandparents was married for 47 years. Grandparents on your mother's side or on your father's side? On my mother's side. Did they know what was going on? They um, did not until, until the end. 
Why didn't you tell them? Um, I don't know. I think I was more, I, I think I was more afraid of my father and my mother's situation. So for me, it was more or less of, I would just make excuses of why I sh should spend the night. Right. I you know, so I would come up with reasons of why I should spend the night with them. Can I spend the summer with you? Can I do this? You know, I would always come up with stuff. Yeah. And and then also, um, they sent me to a lot of therapy because what I do was I started wetting the bed on purpose, yeah. hoping that he would not come in. Oh, wow. And so, um, so I, so they thought that maybe I had some type of psychological issue because I was older, you know, beyond the age of bedwetting, but I was doing it on purpose. Yeah, no. And, and what a brilliant strategy to keep them out. Yeah. Right. Right. What if I, Stormy, where are you in all this? When you hear her say this, and I'm sure this is not the first time you heard her say this, what do you feel in the, in the pit of your stomach? You know, I have, I have, um, mixed feelings about it i i have anger because you know meeting you know her like that and you know you're telling a story you know I'm, I'm i'm angry with you you know um i also have you know that feeling of empathy you know i understand you know where you're coming from and you know why you you know sometimes like i said sometimes you lash out i understand why so you know i understand now you know um, hold, hold it. Let me let me get this because you you now either became a saint in my eyes, <laughs> or or you became someone who is just pushing it aside. What is the empathy for a man who abuses his daughter and beats his wife? It's not a it's not an empathy for him. It's empathy for her. Oh, okay. All right. That, not, so, not, so know. I'm fat, I, then then your saint your sainthood goes down. Your hiding goes down. Uh, yeah. uh, so, yeah, no empathy for him. You know, I don't, I don't, I can't fathom why people do the things they do. They do. Um, I can try. I, I can. I can see it, and I make a choice. Either I'm gonna deal with you, or I'm not. That's yeah. that's what I do. You know. But in a child, I when it comes to children, I, I have no understanding. I don't. If anybody hurts a child, that's that's my pet peeve. We have a problem, a huge problem. Yeah. Um, because they they're innocent and they can't defend themselves. Tamika, what did you feel when you first met Stormy? Did you feel safe? Uh, ironically, I did. So it, it was really weird because... Well, what's ironic? Look at that little smile that she puts <laughs> in. <laughs> well, I couldn't... I had issues with sleeping at night. Yeah. Um, so I could not sleep throughout the night. And the first time that I stayed the night at her home, um, I didn't realize it, but I slept the entire time. Wow. And so my aunt, I spoke with her, she's a pastor. I spoke with her on the phone and she asked me, she said, where are you at? And so I says, oh, I'm at Stormy's house. I said, um, I said, I missed your call because I just woke up. And she goes, you slept? And I was like, yeah. She was like, the whole night? Wow. I said, oh, well, yeah, I guess I did. So I guess I felt a sense of security yeah. which is being there with her. Yeah. I get my sainthood back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you you can never lose it. I'm just playing with you. I, I, I see it in this. I see it. You know, seriously, all kidding aside, when a person has the, has the scope of heart to be able to take in a person that has been in that type of situation and hold the safe space for them, to be able to return to themselves. The admiration I have for you, Stormy, is beyond anything I can say in, in an hour long show. Thank you. And, and Tamika, at least you think that I don't have that admiration for you, for you to be able to see somebody that you can open up with and, and take a risk and open up. Because when you opened up to the person that you thought should protect you and to take care of you, you got the hell beaten out of you. And so did she. And so for the two of you to be able to get to this place is so powerful and so important and so needing to be told. My daughter, who I already told you about, who's developmentally delayed, taught me the most important story I've ever seen. She doesn't have the ability to speak like you and I speak. So when she speaks, people don't understand her. But because I'm her dad and because I've been with her through thick and thin, she expects me to understand her. 
And to, to our credit in our relationship together, a lot of times I do. When most people don't understand her, I sort of get what, we're, what she's saying. And we're not talking about heavy philosophical points like Descartes or Socrates. We're talking about, do I need to eat something? Am I hungry? Am I tired? Do I need to go to the bathroom? Do I, you know, do I need, am I cold? But sometimes I don't. And when she tries to speak to me and she doesn't, I don't understand her, she'll raise her voice and she'll say it louder. She'll yell. When she yells and I don't understand her, she'll tantrum. Because she just wants me. She, she, she just needs to be heard and she's not being heard. And when she tantrums and I don't understand her, she tries to attack me. She'll come running and either try and bite me or rip my shirt or do something. And this went on for a long time. I think I'm a fairly intelligent man, but I couldn't figure out how to stop it. And it would happen sometimes three, four, five, ten times a day. Over the course of about 15 years, 15 years, that's a long time. I didn't always have white hair. I had dark hair like you guys. <laughs> and finally, in the midst of her rage, I said to her, Elisa, I can't do this anymore. You know I love you so much, and I want so badly to understand what you're saying. I just can't understand your words. Can you speak to me in a way that doesn't use words so that I get what you're trying to say? And from the midst of rage, real flat out rage, she went into that smile that just melts your heart. <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, I am daddy. Perfect English. I said, explicative deleted. What the heck do you mean you are daddy? Like, what, what are you talking about? How are you doing that? And she took her finger and she put it to the side of her head like this. And what I understood in her motion is she was putting thoughts in my head. So I said to her, have you been putting thoughts in my head? Because sometimes I thought that that's what you were doing, but I just didn't believe that that was possible. She answered by this laugh that came from the pit of her belly and just gurgled up. And it was so contagious. And we, I started laughing with her and we probably laughed for about five or eight minutes. It felt like it was a year and a half. Hmm. And when we came to it, from that moment on, she's never yelled again, she's never tantrumed, and she's never attacked. And what she taught me is that I see that pattern of behavior in every single person I work with. They can be government officials, they can be heads of, heads of, of military, they can be uh, uh, CEOs of companies, they can be parents of families, they can be teachers in schools. When they speak and they don't get heard, they yell. When they yell and they don't get heard, they create a scene. When they create a scene and it doesn't get heard, they go violent. They, they attack. They either blow up a building, shoot somebody, abuse somebody, hit somebody, beat somebody. And it all comes down to how do we stop the violence? Could it be just so easy as just saying, what is it that you really want to say to me that I'm not hearing? Yep. yep. And it all came from a 30-year-old developmentally delayed daughter, kid. But I use that in boardrooms across the nation to work with companies to say when people, when things aren't working, what's wrong? He said that people just don't feel heard. Mm -hmm. right. What would you say to your, is your dad still alive? No. Okay. None of my, uh, both of my parents uh, are deceased and my grandparents, the, fi the final one passed away last, last year in March. Did that allow you to make the series? Uh, we were actually already in the process of making it, um, but we started filming it um, in August. And um, it was like a month before my mom passed away. We started filming because my mom just kept asking. So have you filmed it yet? Have you filmed it yet? Are you done? I'm like, yeah. well, mom, we haven't really finished it because you're, you know, you're sick. And so yeah. we were spending a lot of time with her. And so she kept asking about it. And so I finally told her, I was like, we got to finish this. We got to finish it. Because she, you know, she kept asking about it. She kept, she wanted to see it. You yeah, know? It's, it's almost her redemption. In some ways, it's, I couldn't speak up for my daughter speaking up, you know, and it's, it's I mean, it's, it's a, somehow a beautiful redemption. Yes. For people who are listening, and I'm sure somebody's listening, for people who are listening that are in an abusive situation or that have parents that 
beat them or or are addicted to drugs or are addicted to alcohol or first of all if that's your situation go to on on channel and make sure you find the series behind closed doors and watch the series because uh, there's how many episodes are are there in the first series six six, six. So six episodes is going to say a lot more than what they can say in a three in a in a three minute answer they're going to give right now. So again, on channel, if you don't have it, ask your television people how you get it, and look for it on behind closed doors. I'm going to also have links in the show notes for how you can get it. You you can go to their website, which is newvisionmediagroup.com. It's spelled in a completely unique way. So don't try and type in new vision the way you would think to spell it. Uh, just go to the show notes, look for it. It'll be right there. It'll lead you right to the, to the website. What would you say to those people who are listening now who wish they had the courage that you have, but don't? Um, it's not your fault. Um, completely not your fault at all. So you have to take yourself completely out the equation of thinking that it is. And okay. at that pa point, pause, pause for a minute. Because you say that so matter of factly because you've done it and you can do it. But yeah. how, how does somebody do that? Because we make up stories throughout the course of our life. All of us do. We make up stories around the course of our life that things that have nothing to quickly my dad passed away i was supposed to wake up to see him before i went to camp i didn't he left early in the morning he passed away four weeks later making love to my mom but he was my hero and i said to myself if i would have woken up he wouldn't have died and the reason i said that was because living in a random world where my hero was taken for me for, from me for no reason was much harder than living in a world where i blamed myself and I had nothing to do with him passing away four weeks later. He died of a heart attack, making love to my mom. It wasn't because I didn't wake up to say goodbye to him. <laughs> right? Right. But we make up those stories and we live with those stories because they get so much power in ourselves because of the stories that we can't bear to, to look at if we give up those stories. Correct. And it's always easier to place the blame on yourself than it is not to. So how would you, who seems like you've walked this journey through therapy, through a, a good partner that you have, through a lot of work that you've done with yourself, how have you removed the mantle of that story from yourself so that you can say, don't blame yourself? Um, for me, um, what I had to do was, I, I, and it, it took a lot. For me, I had to really realize that if I continue to hold in that pain and be angry, I will only be hurting myself as though as, and he would continue living his life as though nothing was wrong. So I could not continue to hurt myself. I wanted to make something better. And I also had really great grandparents that were behind me 100% and that kept me in church. Yeah. And so I just, I literally prayed one night and asked, for God to reveal something to me, for me to be able to move past the pain and the hurt. And at that moment, I said, it's not my fault. He's sick. He's a monster. And at that point, once I started to see him for who he really was, it was like, um, what is that? That transference, that energy of transference. Yeah. And at that point now, I was no longer angry and I was no longer hurt. But now his life was miserable. Yeah. And I was okay with that. But I also had to be okay with the fact of not being angry and still being able to, I was still able to go to his funeral. I took him to chemo, wow. you know, because I did not have that. I didn't hold that, that anger. I, at this point, I felt sorry for him. Yeah. Is it, this is going to sound um presumptuous of me to ask and i don't mean it in any way presumptuous but because i see the transition that you went through were you able in your own heart whether you could say it to him or not were you able in your own heart ever to forgive him 
Um, I forgave him years ago when I wrote him a 15 page letter. Wow. Um, because at that point I put everything in it that I wanted to, I let him know what he did to me. I let him know how it made me feel. I let him know what he will never experience with me. He will never experience walking me down the aisle. He will never experience um, knowing my, if I had children, knowing my children. He would never experience that because I, the trust level, even though I still see him and, as, and he's, my, he's my father, but I don't trust you. And because you've broken that trust with me, you've broken that trust with anything that has to deal with me down generations. So, did he ever respond to that letter? No. Yeah, surprise, surprise. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I didn't, yeah. and and really and truly, I didn't care. I needed to know that he saw it, yeah. and so the way that I knew is I had a certified he had the sign board. Wow. And I had to deliver it to his job, <laughs> so it could not be intervened by his wife at that time, his current yeah. wife. Yeah. Yeah. Um. When did Stormy come into your life? We, um, we got together October 28th, 2016, and we got married July 28th, uh, 2018. Why are you looking at me? You don't know? Uh, no, I'm trying to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good with dates. Yeah, 2018. It'll be two years this year. So um, she's been very, very understanding. I thank God for her truly because... Um, she has the patience, I tell people, of Joe, because my previous relationships were very... So, hold, hold on one minute. You went from a saint in my eyes to Job in her eyes. <laughs> I mean... Hey, you know, it, it's because I still was, even though I overcame a lot, I still had some, some bit of a little anger still sure. that, that was inside of me. Okay. So I would have moments without me knowing and would just lash out or be angry or be sad. And she never judged me for that. She actually would sit there and listen. And then once I was done, she would say, okay, now you're really not upset with me. So let's have a conversation. What are you truly angry at? And then I'm sitting there, I look and I kind of move around. I go, well, hell, I don't know. <laughs> Storm, Stormy, where did you get the calm and centeredness to be able to do that? Where did that and with lots of years of patience and practice, but basically it came from me um, knowing myself and, and going through self-awareness and people thought I was crazy for a moment, but I was, uh, I went eight years, right? Celibate, wow. eight years, um, two years without dating, right? So it was just me getting to know me and who I was. And that actually came, I don't, I, I just woke up one day and I had that revelation. I need to know who I am. I need to be able to be okay if I'm, I'm a, if I'm by myself. I need to be okay with me. I need to be able to love me. And so when I went through that, it, it was a hard thing because I actually called people that I dealt with for years and years and exes and I let call, okay, lay it on me. What are some of the things that you didn't like about me? Wow. Okay. And when I did that, I was like, if I could change it. You know, hey, let me change. Let me be a little bit more understanding. If it was something I can't change, well, y'all got to deal with it, right? right? Because that's me. That's who I am. And so in doing that, it allowed me to, you know, you know, find out things about myself and things that I, I didn't like. So like the second, se like second season is going to be about me and my dad, right? And it's not like Tamika's story, but my father wasn't around. Yeah. Right? And for the longest... You know, I knew I had other siblings. Come to find out, I have nine. Wow. Other siblings, right? And, and when you say, I knew I had other siblings, you're talking about from different moms. From different mothers, correct. Okay. I just wanted, to, that's what I got when you said it, but I didn't know. Yeah. It, it, it from wasn't other, right. From my, my father was, the, that song, my father was a Rolling Stone. Yeah. Um, only thing, his birthday wasn't in September. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I knew that because I, well, actually I knew I had two. Because I was, at the time I was born, I was the youngest, right? So my mom knew of the two. Um, but as we grew older and everything got on Facebook, well, that's how I found out I had other siblings. And I went to go visit them. I didn't, I didn't meet my dad until I was 22, right? Wow, wow. And so um, I really didn't know anything about him. But 
as I'm doing the self-awareness, I realized that I had a lot of animosity against this man because you have other people, you know, you have other kids that you have been around and you spent time with them, but you wouldn't spend no time with me. Yeah. Right. So in doing that, I'm like, you know, I'm going to have something. So the way I came to my realization, I had, I said, and I had a talk with him and I told him, I said, you do realize that you took a lot away from me because I would have been a daddy's girl. Right. And, you know, I think men don't understand how important it is to be in your, in their children's lives. Yeah. You know, a lot of times, I know we discount men being around all stuff, but it's a very important thing, you know, to be in your child's life. So I just want to, I just want to stand up for the few men that do, because I'm one of those few. And, and, you know, we, we make, I, I'm guilty of making we statements and everyone's statements and all those things. Um, there are far too many men. I'm ashamed sometimes to be a man in the world that I live in. But I am so proud to be the man that I am because my daughter is everything to me. I mean, she's the best gift I've ever been given and she's developmentally delayed. So I never in a million years thought I would be able to make that statement because I didn't think I had the cap capacity or bandwidth to do the things I would have to do with a developmentally delayed kid. This is not my show, though. This is your show. Let's talk about you guys. Um, what was it you saw? Stormy and Tamika that made you say, this is my girl? Ooh, um, I want to say it was her independence. And this is even before I knew the story. So, you know, in my, my relationship, I had a lot of people that wanted to depend on Stormy. Can you do this? Can you do this? What can you do for me? Blah, blah, blah. That wasn't the case with her. It was, you know, it was a mutual friendship. She was, I mean, she's my friend. We yeah. we we're cool. We can watch TV. We can play games together. Lay right beside each other, playing different games, right? So it, it that was the biggest thing was the independence, you know. And you know she's kind of easy on the eyes too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she is. <laughs> As are you, my friend. <laughs> and Tamika, when you first saw Stormy, what was it about her that made you realize this is my girl? Um, the fact that she didn't ask me for anything and she was, <laughs> and, and she was intelligent. I didn't feel like I had to dumb down my conversation or who I was in order to, um, to just have a regular conversation where I could have a regular conversation. I could have a intellectual conversation. I, you know, I could have that. You're just like my friend conversation. Cause our first date was, um, at uh, Dave and Buster's main event center. And I'm very, I'm an ex athlete. So for some apparent reason, I've taken all my exes there to see what they could do. Cause I'm <laughs> as far as if they were competitive I and I always beat them. And so it was like, Oh, that's okay. You tried. Right. right, right. But then stormy beat me. And I was like, <laughs> I just had that. And she goes, what's the problem? And I said, you beat me. I've never been beaten. And so at that point, I was interested in actually wanting to have a full out conversation with her and really get to know her intellectually. And we talked for so long, I didn't want to leave to the point we shut Dave and Buster's down. They turned off the lights in the parking lot. Everybody wow. was the hard day to start after that. And we just talked and talked, and I did not want to leave, but we knew that we had to leave because we both had prior engagements the next day. Yeah. And from that moment, we have not stopped talking. Wow. So what I want to highlight to people who are listening, and it's going to be a joke, but it's not it's sort of a joke. This was one beating that you were happy to have when she beat you in basketball, right? Yes, most definitely. <laughs> but yeah. all the other, but so, there was no. So we're going to take that back, retract that statement. She was not happy that I was <laughs> to this day, he still tries to beat she was, She had beat me. Every time she beat you, she said, I won. Yeah, but remember who won the first one. That's all that matters. I got that one. Okay. She, every, I mean, every time we go, that's the so, And that's my, that's my wife. She's very, very competitive right yeah, and so. um so pretty much i won't say everything we do but a lot of things we do that is a competitive spirit and 
um, I, I like it at times. Sometimes I'll be like, look, it ain't, this ain't, this ain't the time to be competitive. Right, you know? right, right. You know, if I say I'm a better cook, she, no, I'm a better cook. And she'll cook uh, up everything uh, in the house. You know, I'm like, okay. I mean, I can eat all week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, when I look at your stories, both of them, and I look at your life path that you've chosen or you've been given or you've taken, I don't know what you believe if you believe we choose the life that we have or just it develops in front of us, whatever you believe. Do you sometimes look at it and say, gosh, we must have been, we must have chosen to get a lot done in this lifetime. We came in black. We came in abandoned. We came in abused. We came in gay. We came in, you know, women. like we, we came in as women. <laughs> we, you know, we came in. We, got three we, we came like, well, like how much do you have to put on yourself to to take on in this lifetime and and like i know the story i i I, can, I can't even imagine the stories but but i have imagination that can figure out where what you've both gone through and yet when i look at you today i see two women beautiful women who are in love with each other who are laughing and happy and happy and smiling and doing things that they could never, never thought they could do and creating, creating things for the world to see that will change the world if, they, if the world does see it. And again, just if you don't know what I'm referring to, it's behind closed doors on, on channel. And if you haven't seen it, you better get out there and see it because <laughs> a season two is about to start and you don't want to have to just uh, watch season one all at one time. But you can watch it. You can, you can do that all at one time. How did you get to the place where you can be happy like you are now. And the reason I'm asking it because I want to follow it up with another question and maybe you can just follow it up each one of you. Okay. Um, you're, you're a microcosm of the world macrocosm. The world is in that place where a lot of bad things have happened in the world. Correct. How do we get the world to, to, to do what you both individually have done and together have done? So first question is, how did you do it? Second question is, what tip would you give to the world so that they could do it too? Um, for me, how did I do it? Um, Self-reflection and realizing that no one has to validate me but me. And for me to want to finally have a peace of mind and, and prolong my life because stress only shortens your life. So I, I had to finally get to the point where I wanted to be happy by any means necessary. If that meant to be alone, to be alone. Um, and to be with someone, to be with someone. But I had to find my happy place and what truly made me happy and not what makes someone else happy. So Tamiko, what's one thing, and then we're going to come to you, Stormy. Tamiko, what's one thing that you could say to the world that would allow them to take on the practice of self-reflection and get to a place of happiness? One thing they could do tomorrow, today. Um, be selfish. Be selfish? Yes. Okay, t and tell me. Being selfish is... You have to care for self before Good. you can care for anyone else. Good. So caring for someone else first and putting yourself on the back burner is only hurting you. It's not, and it's not really helping them. Good. You, would be, you would be amazed at how much you can help the next person by helping yourself first. I love that. Be selfish. Yes. Stormy, you're not off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> how did you go from being... In a, ch in a childhood that was where you were abandoned by the, your dad, who you would have been a daddy's girl, um, to, to a place where you became happy? I made a choice. And I won't say I was ever not happy, but it was something that weighed on me. It was, it was a burden, you know. Um, but I made a choice. And making choices to be happy, that's a, every, everything she said is, she choose she chose to be that way yeah. i choose to be happy i choose to love myself i choose to do that so making choices and um that's one thing people need to understand you always have choices i always say it's only two choices in the world i'm gonna do it or i'm not gonna do it mm. 
that's it. Yeah. You know, and I, we make life complicated because we, we, we overthink things. We want to say, oh, well, if I do this, this is going to happen, you know, and fear. Fear is, you know, the biggest thing that we have is, you know, we don't want to do it because we're scared to fail, scared somebody, like you said earlier, somebody may hurt us for doing it, you know. But again, you have to choose. And once you make a choice and you stand firm in your choice, nothing can stand in your way. Tell me one thing a person who's scared to make a choice you could tell them to actually get them to make a choice. They made a choice. So I when I talk to them, you made a choice. You made a choice to be scary. You, you made it. a choice to, to, to live in fear. That's yeah. your choice. Now, if you want to make a better choice, <laughs> you know, you know, your better choice would be probably not to live in fear. Because, you know, and then take little baby steps. You don't want to do it all at one time. You're not going to be able to do it all at one time. It's just like if when people lose, try to lose weight, they try to, you know, lose weight all at one time. And I tell them in a minute, you didn't gain that weight all at one time. Yeah. You know, so you take, you do little by little. So first thing I usually tell them, hey, start drinking water, drink more water. You drink, you know, one, one glass this day, drink two glasses the next day, and you know, and you build on that. Same way with anything. You want to make a choice. The first thing you do, you make you make a conscious decision. Okay, I'm gonna wake up today and I'm gonna be happy today. Or do something or do something that's outside of your norm. Mm -hmm. So if you've had long hair for 45 years, guess what? Go get a haircut. Yeah. That's the first thing because I believe that you hold energy in your hair, right? And so if you've gone through continuous bad things and, and you are holding on to old stuff, then do something different. Go outside of your norm. Yeah. Go ahead and get your hair cut. Now, that was the one big major move that you made. You got your hair cut. Now, the next move you want to do, hey, if you've been wearing black all your life or whatever, no color in your life, now go buy you a red shirt. Go buy you a, a yellow shirt. Sorry, yeah. is she talking to me? Do I have to get my hair cut? <laughs> just, just baby steps, though. It, it, and when, when it comes to people that want to make changes, yeah. just all they got to do is just make the baby steps. And once they make those baby steps, they'll start seeing different things. Fabulous. And Fabulous. when they see those different things, it becomes a domino effect. And they continue to do things to where it's like, oh, my gosh, it's like a huge eye opener it's almost yeah. like the clouds part and the sun beams down and you go oh my gosh where have i been all my life where have you guys been all my life that's what i want to know <laughs> for people who want to find you <laughs> for people who want to find you which they're going to want to do tell me I, and i'm going to have your website in there but just tell us again how they can get in touch with you you can go to our website at um, new, um, www.newvisionmediagroup.com, and that's N U V Y S I O N. Why? Because it's two women that run the company. <laughs> you should have said why because we love you, right? That's it. <laughs> no, it's the wise head. <laughs> there you go. I love it, and and that will all be in the show notes. Um. I want to just take a minute and thank you both for coming. Thank you for giving your time. Thank you for being so honest and open. Thank you for coming on the show and just trusting me enough that you can tell your story, trusting the audience here enough. Um, it's an honor to get to know you both. And I hope this will be the beginning, not the end of our relationship. I love the work you're doing. I love what's happening. If there's any way I can help you in it, I'm, I'm here to help you in it. And, um, I just want to ask our audience, I take a minute to summarize. I just want to ask our audience one minute. Where in your life are you living behind closed doors? What are you not allowing yourself to think? What are you not allowing yourself to do? What are you not saying that absolutely has to be said? Who are you allowing to do things to you that you can no longer allow to do to you? When will you have the courage to stand up and speak your voice? We think our voice doesn't matter, but we're living now in a world that is entirely different because one man had his voice choked out of him. And one man, a common ordinary man, not unlike Jesus Christ, and I'm a Jew, but not unlike a Jesus Christ who was born in a stable, in a stable as the Reverend Al Sharpton said yesterday at, his, at, his, at George Floyd's memorial. He was born of no regard. Nobody knew him. Nobody cared about him. Nobody thought anything of him. But he was put to rest as presidents and, and leaders of nations were put to rest yesterday. 
and he sparked a movement because it was time. When do you, when will it be your time to stand up and coordinate with the time of the world to literally stand up and get this message out? Support the work that these women are doing. Go to newvisionmediagroup.com. Go to On Channel and, and, and subscribe to it. Watch the series behind closed doors. Comment, donate to them. I bet they could use some money. Donate to them to help build the, to build the cause. Help people, help them do what they're doing because it will bring you out from behind your closed doors. I want to thank those of you who have listened all to all the episodes or to episodes of the Mosaic Podcast. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening and doing that. I thank you for coming to listen to this one. If you like it, please rate it and review it. Share it with your friends. And most important, if you hear nothing more than this one thing from Tamika and Stormy, come out from behind your closed doors. Tell your story. Until next podcast, thank you so much. <laughs>